the schedule a little bit. All right. Welcome everybody to the- Yeah, they're still joining. Okay, I've got my introduction ready. All right. <laughs> Then they just let me know when we can get started officially. Yeah, maybe in one minute. I can... Okay. Hey, I don't see any more attendees joining, so I think we could probably get started. Okay, great. Um, well, let me welcome everybody. The time is now 7.06 and we have a quorum of committee members in attendance. So this public hearing is being called to order. Um, welcome everybody to the December 12th, 2023 public meeting and hearing of the Amherst Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by the state legislature, this meeting is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. So we'll do a quick roll call to make sure everybody is in attendance and the, everybody's microphone and cameras are working. Um, since you're all nodding as I'm speaking, I'm assuming that my microphone is working, I'm Becky. <laughs> and I'll just go around and call people, call on people to, to do this, so Zoe. Um, I'm Zoe Sunglis. I'm a community member. Thank you. Excellent. Rika? Rika Clement. Um, I am a member of the committee. And Suzanne? Suzanne Schilling, also a member of the committee. And Matt? Yes, I'm Matt Larson. All systems are nominal. Excellent. And Nate? Nate Malloy, a, a planner with the town, and I help staff the committee. Great. Um, okay, thanks everybody for being here. Um, so tonight for the um, members of the public who are here, um, the um, purpose of, of our meeting tonight is to set our priorities for the upcoming grant cycle and to also just talk publicly about what that schedule will look like going forward. Um, we also are looking at our at the community development strategy and um, ensuring that both the strategy and our priorities are in line with what the community is, is looking for. Um, from this committee. Um, we also can review our target areas um, tonight as well, just to make sure everybody understands those and see if anybody in the public has any thoughts about those. And how we're going to do this, the, how the meeting will, will work tonight is first we're going to have a, um, a session where the public can speak to us about those topics that I just outlined, and then we'll go into a, a meeting where um, the committee will talk about what we've just heard and make some decisions about what the priorities will be. And for the how many people are here? Oh, it looks like, actually, I can pull it over. Um, it looks like we have eight attendees. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here. And I um, just want to clarify what this meeting is for and what we're interested in hearing from you about, which specifically is about priorities. We're not looking for information about particular agencies tonight. Obviously, we have meetings that are focused on that and where we want to hear all the great details and the great work about what the agencies are doing. Tonight, it's really about um, priorities and subject matter. Um, I will actually read what our priorities are in our current RFP that is available um, on the, um, the website right now, but so everybody can hear those. And what we're interested in hearing from all of you is whether you have any priorities that you would add to that list and whether, um, or if there are any that you think shouldn't be on that list. Tonight, we're making no decisions about ranking priorities or about um, you know, what we think is the most important. It's really just about what should be on that list so that it's as inclusive as possible. And um, so I'll, what the priorities are and have been in the past, um, what we, um, I think we added a few last year, but what they are right now are um, household stabilization, both family and individual, support services for those experiencing homelessness, youth development, services that help develop economic self-sufficiency, including adult education and job training, 
food and nutrition programs, low-cost accessible comprehensive health services um, and insurance navigation, support services for seniors, and transportation services. So those are what we have on there now. And we are, um, you know, as I said, interested in hearing from, from all of you about um, anything you would add, anything you would take off. But again, we're not looking tonight to be prioritizing any particular priorities on that list. So with that all said, um, we're also gonna give everybody um, about two to three minutes to speak. Um, and um, we will, we can open it up. And I'll, let me just ask so one more thing, just if you're comfortable, what we're gonna do is bring you in and actually have you um, be able to see your face and, and talk to you um, live rather than just having your photo, which is um, a practice that we started last year and, and seemed to work successfully. But if, you're, if you don't wanna be on camera, that's fine as well. You can just turn your video off. Sure, yeah, so this, just I, Nate again, uh, this hearing is being recorded and you can raise your hand and then we'll bring you in as a panelist, as Becky mentioned. And I see there's, there is one hand raised. So um, you'll be asked to rejoin as a panelist. And if you accept that, then you can, um, you can speak to the committee. I am trying to, I tried to, let's see, start video. Hey, it's me. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks for coming. And if you can introduce yourself and um and your role in the community just for the we have some new yeah. members, um, so everybody can know who you are and then we'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. Thank you. My name is Laura Reichsman. I'm the director of family outreach of Amherst. And just a little background on me. I grew up in Amherst. I raised my son, who's 43, in Amherst. He's a graduate of Amherst High School. Um, and I have been um, either a caseworker or at um, uh, the director at, fa at Family Outreach for going into my 32nd year. So I know Amherst really well and have known it for a very long time. And um, I'm 60, I'm about to be 62. So I've been in Amherst for a very long time. And so I guess what I would say is that I feel like I can speak to where Amherst is now and um, what families who are struggling are struggling with. And uh, so in in light of what you said, I'm really going to try not to just say, ooh, you know, our housing um, program that CDBG funds, yes, pri prioritize. Obviously, housing is a priori priority on in all spectrums and um, retention, uh, the news that they're um, going to adjust the Section 8, if you have heard about that right now, if you have a Section 8, you absolutely can't live in Amherst. The, it's too high. The, the threshold, the rents are too high. Um, and in fact, we've been having a hard time placing people in Springfield and Holyoke and um, that's intense because that's you, you know we've just been going farther and farther afield to to find you know um housing for people who have section eights so they don't lose them and actually in this last six months we have in fact had two people lose their section eights because they could not find housing that's a problem in our society that's you know and so certainly retention is huge affordable housing is huge um Stabilization of families so they can pay their rent uh, is huge to keep them stable, keep their kids healthy, keep them in the very good Amherst schools. Um, those are all priorities. Food, you know, the survival center um, is, I think, a huge priority, just as representing Family Outreach of Amherst and sees, seeing the huge impact that has on struggling families in Amherst. So I, I would I would say Spanish ser services, you know, we are pretty much the only game in town. You know, we, we see probably five families almost daily because Francine and Rodriguez speak Spanish. Um, I think that's a priority because um, there's, you know, um, we're here and we help. It'd be good if that was a priority, although hiring has been a bear uh, for Spanish speaking family, for caseworkers. Um, and so that's what I would say. So if you have any questions of 
my experience with families. Are you, just so I'm clear, um, when you said um, prioritizing um, Spanish services, is that something that you would add to the list or just for, it's, you just note that it's something that your agencies are needing and your agency needs to? to I think families in Amherst, there's a lot of families in Amherst whose primary language is Spanish speaking. So I, 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 I it'd be interesting to see what other folks say if they think that's true as well. But uh, certainly what we see, what I see, um, what I know, um, yeah, it, I think um, access to the language that you're comfortable in is really important when you're seeking services. And I also recognize that it can be very hard, you know, I'm, yeah. Does anybody else have any questions for Laura? Just uh, to clarify, so are, are you seeing people who have been living in Amherst then with their Section 8 vouchers not being able to stay in Amherst and have to leave Absolutely. Amherst? Yes, absolutely. It, it, the rents are too high. They're beyond the threshold of Section 8. And apparently, so, you know, this article came out where they're apparently going to have it be by zip code. Um, whether that'll happen, you know, work will be great, I hope. But right now, mm hmm you cannot live in Amherst, you know, and if you have a section eight and you've gotten in, there's different things you can do. Sometimes if you have been living in, in a complex for a long time or with a, with a landlord, they'll adjust it. Sometimes you can pay more on the side, say $300 past the threshold. You can pay out of pocket that $300. Sometimes, sometimes that works. Amherst Housing used to allow that more than they do now. Thanks, Lucy. But yeah, but advocates for housing, advocates for stabilization, obviously. I mean, we're all biased. There's no way, but um, you know, that's that's what we see, and you know, um, and Survival Center is is the most brilliant thing, brilliant concept. You know, a lot of a lot of communities don't have anything like survival center. So. Well, thank you so much, Laura. If nobody has thank any you. questions, thank, thank you very much. Very much. We'll look forward to seeing you at another meeting. I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. And hearing <laughs> all about time. family outreach. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. I tried to stay neutral. <laughs> yeah, <you did> great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye. 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 All right, Lev, your hand was raised next. Hi, Lev. Hi, uh, thanks so much. Thanks for joining. Um, if you can introduce yourself and just let everybody know what who you work with and, and your role in the communities for the new members, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. Um, I am Lev Benezra. I am the executive director of the Amherst Survival Center. Um, also grew up for at least part of my childhood in, um, in Amherst, and I'm really thrilled to be back in the community in this capacity. Um, and I just want to check... I okay, like I should be able to. I'm hoping to be able to share my screen just to share one graph that is um, kind of significant, but I'll do that when I get there. Um, so just a big thank you again to the committee and the new members for your thoughtful engagement in this process. Um, and I fully understand that the goal of this meeting is really to weigh in on um, community needs and priorities as currently, um, and that's definitely what I plan to do. Um, however, I guess sort of full disclosure, obviously I'm seeing it through the lens of the trends that we're seeing at the Amherst Survival Center, and that's where I have kind of concrete data, but I really I feel like it speaks to a larger trend that certainly gets at needs um, uh, very much in addition to food and nutrition where I have the most focus. Um, and I wanted to comment, um, I have really agreed in the past that uh, community needs don't change like that much from year to year. And I think I've been now part of these committee processes for a few years and we see 
similar information come up on those surveys. Um, and But I am going to say that over the last year, uh, since the last community survey was conducted, I am actually seeing um, some pretty significant shifts in community need that I think are, are worth speaking to. I It is very evident to me that our community is facing a much greater number of people in crisis level need regarding basic economic stability, their, their ability to meet most basic needs, food, housing, medical care, bills, like essential, essential survival stuff. Um, and one of the evidences of that has been what we've seen at the Emmer Survival Center in terms of just record use of our programs. And this is just, if I can, really quickly, the um, graph that I wanna share here. Um, are you all seeing this graph? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what this shows is just the number of unduplicated individuals who are accessing our food pantry every month. Um, and so at the bottom, gray and blue and green, those lines were the month by month total numbers in 2019, 2020, 2021. Yellow is 2022, we saw an increase. Orange is 2023. 10 out of the 11 months so far of 2023 have set new records for the number of people that are using the MR Survival Center Food Pantry. Um, and if we, there's another graph that I won't go into that um, shares uh, specifically visits and also amounts of food, and that is even more stark. So people are also returning more frequently. Um, but what we see here is just this skyrocketing need and certainly some of that is very specific to food need, but it also really speaks to a family's income and their stability, right? It's all one pot and they're trying to meet these various needs. And so I think that graph is really indicative to um, what Laura was just sharing and, kind of, and really that focus there. The number of people that we really see frankly on a daily basis who come in and as they're registering for the very first time tell us I never thought I would be someone who would need this. I never thought I would be here, right? Like those kinds of stories and lots of different specific stories. But at the crux of it, we were really seeing hugely rising costs of basic needs. Um, we had seen some real wage increases for a couple of years, but they really stagnated. And especially in lower wage jobs are nowhere near the cost of living, particularly in a community like, uh, like Amherst that has a relatively very high cost of living. And then all of the various COVID relief programs for individuals have ended, childcare tax credit, pandemic SNAP, those kinds of things. But the other part that gets a little bit less talked about is that also the COVID funds for organizations have ended as well, that those COVID supports ended. And of course, that means that organizations are struggling to fill that gap because we're seeing this need, that orange line. But what it also means is that those additional services that had been available to families aren't there anymore because those programs, those like expanded programs have now have now been cut. Um, so what I really want to encourage the community, the committee to think about in terms of the priorities this year in particular, based on what I'm seeing is a really high priority on basic needs. Um, kind of like looking at that core level of what our residents need to survive, to be healthy, to be stable. Um, I was already planning to speak to the immense need for services in multiple languages. Um, and I absolutely agree with Laura, the prior speaker, that services in Spanish are critically important, but it is not only Spanish. Um, so I don't think of that so much as a separate priority but maybe something that the committee may wanna consider about access to the other programs and services for speakers of different languages, because that's a really critical need that we're seeing. Um, and I also, this has been discussed previously by the committee, but I think that especially in light of these uh, this explosion of need that programs like ours are seeing, I think it's critically important for the committee to consider in this round funding organizations that are currently funded. Um, I know certainly for us, uh, CDBG makes up about 10% of the food pantry cost of serving Amherst residents. Um, it would definitely not be a problem to have, it would not only not be a problem, it is hugely needed, especially as, as we're seeing these increases, 
to have additional funding, then there would be no issue of supplantation. Um, and I, I, we, we'd be happy to provide that documentation, but I'm sure other organizations would be as well. So I really just want to um, encourage the committee to really be thinking strongly about basic needs. Um, and what I'm really seeing as I'm definitely talking with other local colleagues, um, just this really dramatically rising need related to basic needs, food, shelter, um, clothing, healthcare, uh, really core, core pieces. So thanks so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, that, that, that was helpful. And Yeah, <laughs> any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, yep, I love uh, just it's really enlightening and kind of shocking to see that graph of the need going up like that. Um, do you have a sense of what's the proportion of that increased need that is people who have been here who haven't really needed the help before and how much of it is people coming in in circumstances in which they really need this help? Thanks so much for that question, Nat. Um, I... I don't have an answer in terms of off the top of my head in terms of like the statistics of which it is certainly some of both. Um, but I would say more of the people who are coming for the first time are not necessarily new to the community. So we are certainly seeing an increase in people that are new to Amherst and coming. Um, but a more sing we are also seeing an actually a larger increase, um, I would say, are folks that have been here but are just in, in a really different circumstance than they used to be. So it's a mix of both, um, but with my caveat that I'm, I'm not looking at any numbers right now to do that, but that's kind of my, my gut based on just conversations we've been having. That's fair. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Lev, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So Thank you for your work. All right, Lev, you're going to become a attendee again. Um, let's see, Lori, you're going to be asked to become a panelist. So thank you for um, holding the hearing and for inviting um, multiple voices and perspectives. And um, I'm also speaking as someone who raised my children in Amherst, whose kids played sports and went to the school and were, you know, formed by growing up in Amherst and also by as the director of Center for New Americans. And we have a site in Amherst and we're, you know, so happy to be supported this year. And I, I think I <clears throat> can't disagree with anything that anyone before me has said, because I feel that um, this is a community that's blessed with um, very giving and hardworking nonprofits. And I know that our constituents take advantage of both Family Outreach of Amherst and the Survival Center. So supporting this network of safety um, net providers is really important. I will say that one of the things that always moved me about the Amherst master planning process was that early on, Amherst named um, supporting diversity as a value. And I think one of the first master plans that I read said that diversity was a value that was prized by Amherst residents with the understanding that it needs to be supported. It, it doesn't happen by itself. And I know that when my children were in school, the children who came from other backgrounds were often invisible. They, their parents didn't have cars. They took the bus, although the bus, the transportation was never as robust in Amherst as it might be in, in urban areas. And those kids just sort of muddled through because they were part of this great school system but they often didn't have the resources that other people did. So, you know, we educate and train the parents of many of these children. Um, the community is, yes, Spanish speaking, but much more diverse. Um, there are, if you read the newspapers, everything that is global is local, right? So there are Haitians living in Amherst. There are Afghans living in Amherst. There are Ukrainians living in Amherst. All of the populations that have 
been forced to flee where they were, have found their way into Massachusetts, and many of them are living in Amherst. There are people who have had successful ap asylum applications that we have filed for who are living in Amherst, and all of them need support, and they range from women who never left the ho their home in Afghanistan and were never educated and are getting their first experience of school in our classes um, to people who were professionals. And just think about children who are in our school system being raised by women who have never been to school. So we all know that <laughs> the parent is the first teacher and that to the degree that we can support the parents, they will be better advocates and supporters of their children. So what I wanna say is Amherst has always been a remarkably diverse place, even though immigrants um, are not as visible. Although if you go to UMass Dining Services, they employ tons and tons of immigrants. There are jobs in the community. There is a need for employees. That's why people resettle when there are jobs, even if the housing isn't always affordable or accessible. But there are jobs and the children are in the schools and educating and supporting the parents and connecting them to all these other community resources. That's what we do. So I thank you for the support. And just to consider that um, the education and training that helps Amherst remain diverse should hopefully be an ongoing part of your deliberations, I would hope. Thank you, Lori. Does anybody have any questions for Lori? Great, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Lori. You're gonna, you'll, um, we'll change your role back to an attendee. All right. Hi, Susan, you'll be asked to be um, a panelist. Hi, everyone. Appreciate this committee meeting happening tonight and very much agree with everything that all my colleagues who spoke before me have shared. And um, so I'm, again, Susan DeCastro um, from Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. Um, and we, you know, just from a youth development perspective um, and touching on, you know, all the areas that, you know, that has been shared about by everyone preceding me, we are, you know, certainly seeing um, an increase in, you know, the in needs related to family stabilization, to, um, in, in terms of housing and, you know, there's so many um, yeah, employment needs that families are experiencing and how that impacts their children. So the need for, um, you know, for additional supports for youth who are part of families who are struggling is, you know, definitely, a, you know, there's a, just a significant increase in the demand that we're seeing for, you know, youth um, requesting support who we know would benefit from more support and so you know I'm just I'm so glad that the priorities that have been discussed are going to be or planned to be addressed um, by these funds and um, and um, you know I'm very glad to see that youth development continues to be a priority because it's it's very much interwoven you know with all of the you know all of the needs and that um, have that have been highlighted and discussed um, so yeah, so I just wanted to echo that, and I'm, um, you know, really we're looking forward to, uh, you know, applying for these funds. And as a continuing grantee, I would have, you know, if there, I know something that I've you know, discussed with Nate as well, but any, um, you know, any uh, information regarding, you know, returning grantees and how to, you know, kind of how to approach um, requests for you know, as a continuing grantee but how to also you know request funds for this new cycle in order to you know best address the the growing needs that we see um that would be that would be greatly appreciated so i hope that that can be part you know any more information that can be available through this meeting or through other sources on that topic would be great so That's thank you all for your consideration and everything that you do to mobilize these funds but are greatly needed and much appreciated. 
Thank you. I want to just to address your point about the, um, you know, the overlapping time period. And, and um, we have, um, well, I should, we, Nate, um, ha, is, I know, trying to get as much information as he can um, sort of on the on the back end about that, because it's something that we obviously wouldn't want anybody wasting any time filling out an application and then not us not being able to give it because it somehow doesn't meet the requirements. Um, so any information we get, we will share immediately. Great, I oh, appreciate that very much. Thank you for your, does anybody have any questions for Susan? Okay, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, you so much. Thank you for your work. Take care. Appreciate it. Take care. Susan, I'll change your role back to an attendee. Okay. Thank you. And then, Nate, it looks like nobody else has a hand raised right now. Um, so um, maybe we'll just make sure that Nobody who's here who hasn't spoken wants to it gives them everybody an opportunity to raise a hand. Sure. Yeah. In the meantime, I'll read um, or I'll paraphrase an email that came in today from a resident who said okay. that they um, frequently use East Pleasant Street to come in from their neighborhood to the town center or to for their kids to go to school. And they find that, um, you know, East Pleasant in particular is dangerous with a sidewalk only on one side and fast traffic speed. And so generally they, you know, recommended sidewalk and pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure in, in and around the town center as a priority. Um, and, um, you know, they had certain things like bike lanes on East Pleasant Street, you know, maybe more, um, you know, roundabouts or stop signs um, near Strong Street or some traffic calming. And then, you know, sidewalks on East Pleasant as specifics, but more generally just, a, you know, um, you know, focus on transportation projects as a priority. And so um, I just wanted to get that on the record. Great. And it looks like nobody else is raising their hand. So um, maybe we'll transition into the public meeting. Sure, I think we can do that. We could wait one more minute in case someone, you know, decides to speak. Um, I'll just check my email too. I don't I think anyone has emailed me this evening. All right, looks like Lev. Looks like Lev raised her hand. But you can unmute yourself. Hi, sorry. I just, um, Jen Wiston is, we're sharing a computer, um, but she was hoping to speak. So I'm not actually trying to oh, speak again. So, oh, so hold on. Let me make, uh, make, uh, make, I'll make Jen a panelist. Um, and then she can be visible. I think you're a panelist now. Yeah. Hi everyone. So I'm um I'm here in my not my town capacity, but my capacity as the board president of the Amherst Survival Center. And I just kind of wanted to reiterate some of the things that Lev had said, particularly with the rising cost of groceries. And I just want folks to remember that things like food stamps and the housing allotment and you know, haven't been increased in a very long time. And so if you were a family of five and just say hypothetically, you were getting $497 in food stamps and that might've gotten you three and a half weeks of groceries, it now probably gets you about two weeks of groceries. And so I just really wanted to reiterate that that basic need for, for groceries is very high right now. Um, and that was really it. And I, I thank you all for your time. Thank you. It's helpful to hear concrete examples like that. So I appreciate you coming on with yeah. that. Does anybody have any questions for Jen? Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. I'll change your role back to an attendee. Sorry, I was trying to type some notes too at the same time.
So uh, while the, while the, some of the attendees are still here, I, I think I had emailed some. I thought I emailed this out, but I it can. Um, I'll say it now. We can put it on the website that the state's recommending for social service agencies and say for um, Valley is um, um, starting a technical assistance program for micro enterprise businesses. But for those types of services that they start on July 1st, 2025. So our current uh, awards grants will run through June 30th, 2025 for social services. And that's when the grant um, program um, kind of the first initial contract end period is. And so the state's recommending that if if a, an agency gets an award in the 24 cycle that we just start the contract on July 1st, so there's no overlap. And so I had asked about supplanting and other things and the response really was just start at July 1st, so there's no overlap. I think I think there's some, I think it's more than supplanting. I don't, I don't it sounds like they, they really wanna have that, um, that way they don't have to justify that it's an expansion of a service or something. So, you know, for like a month of overlap or a few months of overlap, they just said it's easier if you just have contracts, you know, go back to back. Um, and, and is so, that the case, Nate, for even if it's a, a if we end up giving money to an organization that isn't currently getting money, everybody? No, should no, them. they could That's start earlier point. then. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the July first twenty. So just to clarify for everyone, the July first twenty twenty five is only if they're a current grantee. Right. What was our two year grant allotment? Right. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we had our contracts running. We had our contracts running through June thirtieth. Sometimes the funding might um, be expended before then, but the program would still run through then. So that's kind of what the contract program period is. And so that way, the next contract would just start um, in July. And so, you know, what that means for the town is that our grant may be underspent. Um, you know, when it comes time for the next cycle, you know, we might not have spent. Typically, they want seventy percent spent within you know a year so we can always request a waiver and i said well what if we run into this issue and they said well you know we've told you that it, it could happen so I, I think that they'd be aware that this is kind of how they're going to recommend it to a lot of communities so i don't really see it as an issue helpful good to know so the good thing is that it doesn't you know cause a problem um, but I guess on the flip side, it means that for agencies that we've been funding, there's no kind of additional uh, uh, funding that they can kind of double up on. So it'll be just extending. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess if they wanted to say it was an expanded service and clearly demonstrate that, then um, maybe they could start the funding early. But I'd want to, um, you know, if anyone has questions about that, we could send me an email and we could, I could go back to the state. So, you know, for instance, a survival center showing greater need, but is just increasing the amount of certain, you know, um, food and certain things available because there's a greater need. Is that considered an expanded service or not? You know, does it have to be something, you know, is it just, you know, <clears throat> is it the same service just meeting more need? It would an expanded service be like, oh, we're now doing I know they say they do like a you know kids boost or whatever during school vacation. It's like oh now we're doing something different, a different you know? type of program. And, yeah, and so that's why I think they said July first because I don't think they want to then have to turn around and uh, try to explain it to HUD or someone if they're saying well what is the expanded activity if it's somewhat um, difficult to decipher that it's just easier to run it you know sequentially and not concurrently. Okay. So the next, um, well, I guess in terms of the agenda, um, we should just start if anybody has any announcements. That was a good announcement that Nate just gave. Does anybody else have any announcements they want to make? I, I'll say that I think we talked about it before the webinar started that the new, the state pushed back the grant application deadline to March 25th so that the, um, schedule we'll talk about will probably change a little bit and it's, it's been posted online so some of the dates might get pushed back a bit and it looks like we need to change the dates anyway now learning that um tuesday night ends up not being a good night for all the for everybody um so i think we had um 
just started a discussion when we moved into the the meeting about um the calendar um and i think i had asked whether but didn't we didn't answer whether thursday night or i guess whether monday or thursday really the remaining two possibilities for people and if anybody has any regular obstacles on either of those two nights that would keep them from coming looks like no i often have board meetings on monday nights but you know depends on the not every single week but maybe a couple times a month so thursday is a better night for you probably i mean some mondays will work too but I'm, are we going to we're going to talk specific dates not just days of the week correct but, but we, yeah we but, have enough um i think we have three meetings that we need to reschedule um Oh, maybe just the two, actually. Yeah, maybe just the two, just yeah. the rest of it is sort of behind the scenes. So if we moved, so right now we have February 6th and 13th, but if we moved those um, to the, the, I guess we could maybe do the 12th and the 26th. Would that, or no, that doesn't make sense. To the... Well, if we, let's just... Um... I took some notes on the strategy, but if we want to do dates first, we had originally that the proposals were due on the 16th mm -hmm. and maybe we, we could push that back to January 19th. Mm -hmm. And if we still just wanted to do a week um, for quite, so you know, then the committee would give me questions on the 26th or by the 26th, we'd ask applicants then to have them back on the 2nd. And that that should be fine. And then, um, and then it would be when is the next? When is the block grant committee meeting to review the proposals and rank them? And so, so if know, we moved our first meeting, if we moved the public meeting to, oh right, to get your rating. Sorry, I'm just looking at the. Yeah, I was looking like would it, would it be February eighth? Um, is that enough time? You know, it's just, um, you'd already have read the proposals. What, what, you know, from the second to the eighth, you would, we'd get any in, new information. Right. So if we got our, if we gave you the, if we tried to have our first, maybe the public meeting on the, on the 12th and we got you our responses on the eighth, is that what we're thinking? If we, want to do the, yeah, if we want to do the Monday the 12th, that that works for most for most everyone. Does that work for everybody, Monday the 12th? No. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll make it work. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. And then... Okay. And then we want to skip the following week, so because it's school vacation week, so maybe the move, the public hearing have that be on the twenty Monday the twenty sixth or Thursday the twenty ninth. Yeah, I have a board meeting already on the twenty sixth. Does Thursday the twenty ninth work for people? Okay. Hey, that's leap year, isn't it? It yeah. is. Oh. Are there leap year celebrations that we're going to be? I don't know. Should be. <laughs> <laughs> the um, yeah, that works out. I'll say for timing wise, for me, I think that's good if we have that time between the meeting and the hearing, so the town manager and staff can review the committee recommendations, and also gives the committee time. If, for instance, on the twelfth, we can't uh, finalize everything, maybe we'd have a, you know a supplemental meeting in there that week. And then that gives um, gives me three weeks to um, then you know put the whole application together, which is is really what it takes. It takes you know yeah. quite a bit of time to get everything. Then um, so that would work pretty. That schedule works out pretty well. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um... So um, should we move into a discussion and review comments from the public hearing? Are you ready? Unless anybody has any other announcements. Um, 
So um, just to sort of, as we're thinking about what kind of the themes that we heard, I think one of the, um, you know, one thing to remember is that we can change both um, priorities by, you know, adding or, or deleting from the list of priorities, but we can also add in um, that, that we're looking for organizations to, to include in their discussion how they work with people who speak different languages, for example. So we had decided last time around, for example, I think that around climate, um, we wanted to hear, I think, how people's green initiatives and, and how they sort of factored climate issues into their work where relevant, but we didn't make that a priority. Um, and so I'm thinking that with the language piece, that might be something, you know, hearing hearing from, I think there were at least two people who talked about it, maybe even three, that that might be something we would consider adding into the um, the portion of the, um, of the application um, where it's not a priority, but it's just including sort of you know how they um, how they handle that issue in their organizations. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Just looking at the RFP, there's a um, um, one of the social service RFP items under project description is identify the roles and responsibilities of all personnel involved in the project as well as internal controls. Mm -hmm might be a good place to add, you know, kind of language proficiencies. Yep. I mean, could we say, you know, we'd like to know how they address working with non-native English speakers? I mean, just, I mean, maybe there's language, there's language proficiencies, proficiencies on staff, but there are any other strategies they use as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so I, you know, I can let me share my screen and then um, I'm just some live edits. Maybe if we're all looking together while we're speaking. Is this visible for everyone? Yes. Yes. No, we I'll uh, make a little. So I, I was just adding this bullet right here. How organizations ad address um, how organization addresses non-native speakers, and I'll just say translation services. I mean, it could be, um, you know, is that kind of Rika what you were saying? Yes, I don't know. I I, I mean, addresses working with non-native speakers somehow addresses non-native speakers non seems a little non -English weird. English speaker speakers. Yeah, non-English. Not or not a non-native English, but for whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want to say it like this? No, no, the, the native ads. Yeah, yeah. Right. just non-English yeah. non -English speakers. Speakers, right. Well, except that, you know, I do, do teach English to some non-native speakers, so they speak English, but mm -hmm. I would say they still need some more assistance around that. So maybe it's for whom English isn't yeah. primary language or. What did you say, primary? Yeah, I don't. I think that's good. Clients who are, who for whom English is not the primary yeah, language. Right. Putting a lot of pressure on you to type perfectly, Nate, as well. I know, really. And it's hard to wordsmith <laughs> something as a committee, but. That's all right. I, I actually say this is one of the benefits of Zoom, so we can do something like this. Oh, good. Uh, so or you can say, how do organization address barriers in communication? And then. Mm -hmm. No, I think this is more specific. That's good. Yep. Or I mean, yeah. And it could well, just and be... maybe communication, for example, working with clients for whom English is not a primary yeah. language. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Because that's a little broader, because there could be other 
there could be other yes you know yes. so it's not only yeah. english but it's uh, um you know american sign language and exactly so yeah. right yeah. i know i was always jealous there was a uh some friends of mine in college who i think they majored in, in american sign language but they would talk to each other at parties and all the time and i was like man it's not fair <laughs> <laughs> right i know i'm always jealous of people who can speak multiple languages <laughs> yeah um all right, and then um, you, <laughs> yes, thank you. The um in the uh, strategy, I just put a few notes, and it and it, I think it's things that are already mentioned. But you know, when we're talking about housing, I said housing opportunity for all income levels and demographics, and I think it's in this um in the narrative. Uh, but you know, to me, that's something that um I gathered from tonight. So anything that's highlighted, you know, basic needs, uh, services with translation, um, services. Do you um, want to put that up, Nate, to, or go to that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I, uh, I know you're looking at it, I think, but we're not. Yes. Yeah. I thought, how come I can't find this? <laughs> yeah. And why? Oh, there we are. Right. So in this, so is this visible now in the strategy? Yes. Yes. I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, so I just, you know, it was highlighted here are some notes from tonight, housing opportunity for all income levels and demographics. And I would just make sure that we have, have that within this paragraph and then as a priority on the action list. Uh, similarly, basic needs, uh, network of providers that support community, I think education and training of immigrants or residents, um, food security. So I think we say, I just want to make sure that it's actually, you know, it is yeah. express, expressed um, in this document. Uh, workforce training and technical assistance programs is something that I heard. And, you know, as part of the strategy, unfortunately, it's supposed to be, you know, this very short, concise document, uh, and then also list, um, you know, action steps, um, translation services. And I think that what we've done in the past in the state hasn't said anything is we have, you know, um, a category from the master plan is how this is developed and then time frame and then the activity, we kind of usually keep it broad. And so I think it captures everything that was said tonight. I don't think we need to tweak, you know, for instance, number two is community services. And we say, you know, social service programs, including but not limited to a number of things. I think it um, addresses all the comments that were said tonight, same with the housing option. And so, you know, later on in the cycle on the February 29th hearing, we'll also include, um, you know, a comment on the recommended activities, but also a final review of this strategy. So if over the course of the next few months, we determine that we think the, you know, the strategy could be updated a bit to reflect a little bit more accurately the proposals that are recommended, we can do that. So I think it actually says it, um, you know, I'm not sure we're missing anything. And this was updated, I think pretty thoroughly last year. Uh, we had a pretty big rewrite. The only thing I might suggest under community services is, you know, it talks about food security and nutrition. And I think what we're hearing more about is just addressing basic needs, you know, not just getting nutritious food, but getting food at all. Um, so I, I might make that a little bit more about addressing basic household needs. Um, that would be my recommendation is, is make it a little bit more just baseline getting food. Yeah, I mean, I know, and I, you know, Suzanne, I agree. And I think there was, I feel like the word crisis is something we crisis. heard tonight. And I don't know whether we put that in, um, but it's. I mean, we do, I, I could change it here. Support social yeah. programs that address basic household needs. Yeah, right. I think you could even use that rather than the food security and nutrition programs. Um, because we're beyond just, you know, making sure that they're getting nutritious meals that we just need to make sure families can provide food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll say food security programs. I think the state sometimes gets particular that we want to identify specific activities. So I don't uh -huh. want to say uh, services that um, address household needs and not include this just yeah. so here we could point to like we did mention food or 
um, certain you know household stabilization or um, you know economic self sufficiency, and so we can say that the activities then address this you know second priority. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Thank I think you. That's a great suggestion. The other piece that I think is, I don't know that it's in here, but I'm looking at, um, you know, Lori's point about supporting diversity as a value um, and whether, I know that we added that, maybe we can go back to the RFP in a minute and look at that, but is that incorporated, the idea? Oh, it is. Okay, here we go again. We have it here. Um, let me just make a note here. Yeah. And so I'll just, um, you know, tomorrow I'll just review the document to make sure that these, what's highlighted is, is clearer in these sections and I can send it out with like track changes and I can put it online. So it's, it's easy to see what's been updated. Right. And can we go back to the RFP and just look at the diversity mm -hmm. piece that we have there? I just can't remember exactly how we and is that is that visible for everyone now? Yes. Yes. I, as well. Where is that in the document? I feel I can't remember. Um... Yeah. I, um... But I thought that we included it as. I mean, it, maybe it's um... above above in the sort of listing of the priority people to talk about yeah yeah sorry for the scrolling yeah i thought it, i thought it was up here i didn't i mean we have in fact the priority of addressing Maybe rates that's how seven. we did it yep yeah. that's sort of different though it's a different it is Uh, I just did a keyword search. I don't know if I if they, if they found it. Um, yeah, I mean, is that was that bullet enough, or do we have would we want to have it somewhere else in this document? I mean, I think the I, you know, Lori's point was that of that supporting diversity is is a value in the town you know that the town or is a quality that the town values um mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think would, would it go somewhere in community involvement and support yeah. mm -hmm. or we just add that as a bullet point after the um how does it impact addressing systemic racial injustice? Add another bullet point about addressing or you know, promoting diversity. And maybe not just promoting, but sort of recognizing the value of. I mean, I'm thinking about, I guess, you know, I think about like a the survival center, for example, ensuring that they ha have different foods for different cultures you know, that that seems like some, that's not necessarily, um, that's really recognizing the value more than I guess promoting. All right, so I added this. Um, that looks good. Yeah. I like that you just add in some of those and this is. Pandemic, one other change in this. I think we added another bullet. I just want to, um, yeah, here we are. I like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're looking at social service for non-social service. I still think, you know, we have, um, you know, the three target areas and 
um, you know, we'll try to get the word out some more about getting projects going. The town's already started talking and, you know, I've emailed certain organizations and it's, it's been in the paper. So uh, some of it is, you know, we hope, I hope we get, you know, a few different project um, applications and proposals. And so, including you know, we have to build Pleasant up Street. to our grant. What's this? Including East Pleasant Street. Yeah, you know, it's really tricky. I was in a, I'll share my screen. The um, Even though the town's considered a majority low mod, the, uh, that's not what I want. There is. Um, Nick made that comment last year too about East Pleasant Street and the sidewalk, like a sidewalk. Yeah, and I think, is that is this map visible? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the green, I, I think it comes up as kind of greenish yellow. Those are considered the income eligible areas in town. And so, um, but we still have to define a service area for an activity, uh, which is, you know, so we have to determine like, okay, where is it that most likely, you know, whoever would use it. So if we said sidewalks, you know, on East Pleasant Street here, you know, it could be that, okay, most of the residents in this area will use it and it might be eligible um, you know, we could, we'd have to say that, for instance, that a lot of say students or in areas that are not income eligible wouldn't use it. And so when we've applied in the past last year for the combined grant, we are doing some work on East, this section down here on, um, we call it Southeast Street Extension. It's on the common and then a little bit of um, Belchertown Road right here, Route 9. And that's in an income eligible area. And it was pretty easy to say that, you know, doing sidewalks in here when the block groups are 70% low mod that the users will, you know, will be a majority low, lower moderate income. It gets trickier in other parts of town. And so, you know, unless it's a, an affordable housing project or something that specifically addresses, you know, the, the income eligibility piece, it's hard to say, let's do sidewalks or, you know, public infrastructure in, in quite a bit of the town actually. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's just, you know, I think it's just, it's get, it gets tricky to find eligible projects. So did you say it, it is okay if, if the project is right on the line of the income eligible area? Yeah, well, we'd have to do those, say, for instance, if we said, oh, if, um, a portion of East Pleasant Street, say it's up here. Yeah. We'd say, well, um, that means, you know, the neighbor, this neighborhood, which is slightly below majority and this neighborhood would use it. And we, you know, typically we'd say that the service area for a sidewalk might be a half of a mile to three quarter of a mile radius around it. Radius, like yeah. Walking distance. And so then we do some statistical manipulation of the census data and we'd say, okay, is it, or is it that, you know, buffer area, a majority low mod and, um, I see. you know, and so, here might not it'd, be yeah it'd be close right it'd be close right yep you know get down here yes uh, it would be better clearer so, yep okay. so i think what i heard tonight and i you know we say actually we mentioned east pleasant street explicitly in the um strategy um as one of uh the goals was um at the end of the doc or you know one of the you know eight kind of um, priority things. Uh, number three was transportation. And we say a, a continuous, safe, accessible network of you know, pedestrian and bicycle or multi-use pathways. And we mentioned East Pleasant Street as one of those areas. And so um, I know the town manager would like to see more work done in the town center. The only caveat there too, there's another one in that any work in a neighborhood, it should be at least 75% residential. And if it's a mostly commercial area, the concern is right, then the users may not be the people who live there. And so, you know, we couldn't do like North Pleasant Street with all the shops, but we could do some of the um, streets around the town center. So I'm assuming we'll see some proposals for that type of, you know, some sidewalks and in, in public infrastructure. Do we typically get a large number of applicants or submitted, you know, that we would have to review? Uh, I think for social services, it can range from anywhere from, you know, five to 10. Okay. And for non-social service, we can only fund three, up to three. So, um, you know, even if we had a, a number, we could only recommend three. Um, but typically we might have two to four. 
okay. I, I think some of it is the capital projects with block grant have such strict requirements. The program does that, uh, you know, a lot of times agencies won't propose projects. So, you know, affordable housing, 51% of the units have to be affordable, which is a, a high number. The housing authority would, will often apply because most of their, all their units are considered affordable. And so that works for them. But, you know, a developer, for instance, wouldn't come in and take block grant money because typically it's like 20 or 25 percent of the units are affordable, not 51 percent. And so, um, you know, we were using it to do we could use it to do like a neighborhood playground, public infrastructure, housing. Uh, you know, we don't have a urban renewal area. So some communities use it for facade improvements in downtowns or sign signs in the downtown. We we are not really eligible for that. Um, direct assistance to micro enterprise businesses where the owners are and, and or workers are low or moderate income that's eligible and Valley CDC is uh, taking advantage of that. Um, and so, yeah, actually in a meeting with some block grant communities a few weeks ago, someone actually said, oh, it's getting hard, harder to find eligible projects because their community is not a majority low mod. And then with the service area um, that we have to define each each capital project with a service area, um, you know, you, you really have to, uh, you know, you have to justify any vacant land, what's happening in the next five years with it, what are the plans for housing in the area, for economic development, and then um, it takes a little bit of justification to do the project. But. So in terms of the, um, the RFP, um, are we at a place where we can just say it's, it's done. Do you want to send it out one more time to all of us for one final read through? Or it looks like we agreed on those two minor additions or three, I guess. Um, yeah, I by sent minor, them out. I don't mean minor importance, but just they were small. Yeah, I sent them out today. I mean, if, if the committee wants to look at, you know, individually, and we could say that we'll st I'll still try to issue it by Friday at the latest. And so okay. I'll revise the dates. And I think with those additions, I think they're probably all set. So I had gone through the other week and updated all the dates and information and they've been online and you've seen them. So I don't, you know, unless there's, you know, we can give everyone another day or two to look at it if there's anything major, but. Um, well, we'll, why don't we say this? If we, if you haven't heard from us by 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, then go for it. All right. Okay. Um, and um we just talked about the target areas i'm just going through the agenda so i think we're we're good there um and then we have public comment if any of our three public want to speak again on these topics we can give them a second to raise their hands if they want and while we're waiting for that actually we can does anybody have any topics that were not reasonably anticipated before we put the agenda together. All right, and I don't see anybody's hands raised, so I think we're in good shape. So our next um, convening will not be until February, but we'll be doing a ton of work between now and then, right? Yes, and um, yeah, and if any committee member, I guess we, I could ask now, I could ask an email. It sound, well, I think last time most members wanted uh, paper copies of the proposals. And so then I can, you know, I'll make copies when they come in for everyone. Great. Sounds like thank it. you. Because we're all old people. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so just, just to um, confirm then, so you're getting all of the applications in January 19th. Is that right? Yes, yep. Yeah. And then um, we'll get questions back to you by January 26th. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of kind of crunch time for looking at all the stuff. And the meeting on the 12th is typically a longer meeting, correct? Because we're going to be reviewing ranking or how we each had right. sent in our rankings to you and then kind of determine who we would be issuing. And right, also so hearing like, from the organizations as well. So that's all right. packed in, yeah. 12th is usually a longer one. Yeah. yeah okay. I think for the 26th, Nat, you're kind of right. That is a crunch time. I think it could be that the first read of the proposal is some something just, you know, is there missing information, general questions? You know, you're not necessarily, you may not 
um, community members don't necessarily have to do the ranking yet you have until the 12th, but it could just be looking through saying if, you know, if, you know, we think the budget sheet might be, it might be missing or, right. you know, maybe they didn't have an, um, an explanation of a certain part of the program or service. Matt, are you thinking it makes more sense to give a little more time on that first read? As you look, because it does seem like it's a, that's a short period and whether we should. Yeah. Yeah, maybe because then, um, I guess the question is how much time then do we give the organizations to respond to any questions that we have? He, well, I thought that was going to be questions would be due back February 2nd. Right. And then and we'd then, have until the 12th. So we could actually change that a little bit. Um, I could give you, I mean, you could have until the 29th or 30th, you know, give you a weekend again. Okay. That'd be nice. That's, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we get you our questions by the 20, by the, by four o'clock on the 29th? Okay. Sure. That day. And then we give. Wait a minute. I thought we just said, oh, oh, right. And then rankings are the 12th. Okay. Questions by the 29th. Yep. And yep. then we could, then we give applicants, you know, a week, say, until the 5th. Yeah. And then you have, then after their questions, their response is another week to really, you know, um, digest everything and come up with the rankings. Although actually, wait, if we're meeting now on the 12th, that's what we said, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll have read them. We'll have done a right. first read yeah. through. And, and so, you'll need, so Nate, the, when would you need our rankings by to have them ready for the meeting on the 12th? The 11th. The 11th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, what we've done in the past in the last few years, which I think is nice, I don't have to see your individual score sheets. It's just your ranking. So, you know, okay. if you put agency one, two, three, four, whatever, and then I, I um, you know, um, if everyone sends me those and it can just be something I can share and it, and, you know, if it's, you know, it's almost like a scatter plot, like, oh, these few might be kind of everyone agrees is the top few and here's some middle. Yeah, I think that that works. Right. It's good to have these days in advance, so you are making them part of your yeah routine. Yes. Yep. Great. All right. Does anybody have any other issues? Anything else? All right. Well, um, we'll see everybody on February twelfth. But um, lots of work in between and. Um, just a reminder to everybody that if if questions come up as you're reading or you have any issues, don't email the whole group because that's a public mm -hmm. open meeting violation. So just email Nate and he can get the information out to whomever needs it. And he can send emails to all of us. Okay. All right. Great. 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 All right. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Have Thank you. Bye. Have good holidays. Yes. Nice. You too. Yes. Thank you. Bye.